Mary, we wanted to give something back to the Tibetans. We have taken their art, we, I have I preserved them in, in my house, perhaps I can have a chance once to give it back, but in the moment it's in our house, out of their hands. So I felt guilty, and I wanted to give them something back. So we started this science teaching for monks. And I'm just coming from that. Yesterday morning I came from the Dalai Lama Institute of Higher Learning where we had such a teaching course going on. And it's still going on today and today the members of this course are coming here to Tumko University. Anyway, that's my giving back or part of it. And I'll just show you a few pa beautiful paintings. I mean, here, a manuscript page. You see already these beautiful colors here, this cinnabar, this red, this the Tibetan writing here. That's a page in my collection, 14th, 15th century. This is a nice story here, which I don't want to read to you. But there are very nice stories on it. So it's informative. It's here inscribed. Here's a story of, of a a rich merchant's daughter, that's this one here, and the Bodhisattva, Sadra Parodita, who is sitting here on the horse, and so on. Very nice stories, beautiful paintings, and here again a Yamantaka painting. A similar one as I have bought in Lugano when I was so ill. And I told you Yamantaka, he's a conqueror of death. He helps in the process of being reborn. And he, in fact, is an incarnation of Manjushri, of the deity of wisdom. Let's look at the details a little bit more. We have him here again with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine heads. And eight of these heads are frightful, and one is peaceful. That's a peaceful head up here. And the peaceful head here belongs to Manjushri. A Manjushri is the deity of wisdom. So Yamantaka is in essence an incarnation of Manjushri. So he, he incorporates uh, wisdom. So you see, I think that Yamantaka is a beautiful symbol for us scientists. I mean, we scientists, we also want to become immortal. We become immortal by our immortal papers. Immortal papers which we write, no errors in it, they will be read even in a thousand years still. So we become immortal. For that we need the strength of a scientist and we need the intelligence, the wisdom of Manjushri. So that's for me a, a symbol, a metaphor for a scientist. That's my interpretation, very personal interpretation. Here you see another painting. That's the eighth Dalai Lama who was enthroned enthronement in 1780. And this painting has been done on that occasion. You see him here as a young monk. You see here his birth house where he was born with his family here in this room. And here you see now all the guests coming to this ceremony. The, the guests coming from Mongolia, the guests, sorry, the guests coming from Mongolia, the guests coming from India, guests coming from China, from all the different countries. And you can study here the physiognomies of these various people beautifully on this painting, which is hanging now in our house, actually in, in the room where I do my studies. Here this other painting which I mentioned, this monastery, Tege Monastery. And the most interesting fact of this painting here, but there is a painter's workshop shown. We have to enlarge it. It's a workshop of Su Zhen, of a very important editor of Tibetan scripts and a painter. And we look here at this workshop. You see it here. It has two rooms, one room and a second room. Let's look at the first room here. That's Su Zhen. Su Zhen, he is making the drawing here on a canvas with black ink drawing a Tanka painting. And this monk here, that's a master painter, Su Chen. That's a, a monk mounting the canvas. That's a monk who prepares the ink on this board. 
a small monk holding the ink pot for the great master. We have here a student and his teacher watching what the great master is doing. And down here, who is that? That's a good for nothing. He's just, just sitting here and look, what, 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 watching the, the birds flying by, not being involved in, in working. So relaxation is also important in this process. Anyway, these are the student papers here, putting on in the pigments, which the great master has marked with symbols. So here I, I am now in a workshop in Nepal trying to learn a little bit about this kind of painting in order to maintain my collection. So you t t take a wooden frame, you attach a piece of cotton to it, you apply a gesso consisting of chalk in height glue, and then you start. Yeah, this, that's what I'm doing, applying the, the chalk milk to the, the canvas. and. You have to flatten it with a, with a stone and then you can start to do the drawing. That's what I'm doing here. Not for producing a tanker, just for trying to get some experience in restoration. Then you have to use these pigments which are inorganic materials like malachite, azurite, cinnabar, red lead, raw pigment. And you have to know what to do. And you need also analysis of that, so you need some chemistry. When you look at the chemical formulas, for example, of the blues here, you see azurite has copper, indigo has no metal, lapis lazuli has aluminum, smalt has cobalt, and Prussian blue has iron. So if you do a simple elemental analysis, you can find out what sort of a blue is in the painting. But for that, you have, of course, to take samples out of the painting, which you don't like to do. So I like to use a non-destructive way of analysis. But what I'm doing with this knowledge is to do a little bit of restoration. You have here a tanker before restoration, after restoration, before restoration, after restoration, before restoration, after restoration. That's what I'm doing in my spare time. Beautiful work. Very detailed work. You have to use it. Use a microscope in order to put in the pigment corns in very small amounts and try to, to fix a painting like that. Beautiful work. I like to do that very much. And with this analysis of these pigments, I could then determine where these paintings were, have been coming from, from Nepal, from Tibet, from India, from China, or from Mongolia. They all do this kind of tanka painting. Many Buddhists here in this area and they produce this kind of works and you have to know where it comes from. You can analyze pigments and pigments tell you a little bit about it. And the analysis which I'm using is not an MR, it's Raman spectroscopy. Raman, you remember, Raman, he is the man of the most famous citizens here of this city, not of Tumkur, but of Bangalore. He lived in Bangalore for a long time, did his studies in Bangalore, and this technique I'm using now. You see, it's a very simple technique. He takes, when, well nowadays, and takes a laser, and irradiates here the, the sample which one wants to analyze, and gets some stray light out, and the stray light contains now additional frequencies. The side bands here in the spectrum, that's the original frequency, these are the side bands. And the side bands, they contain the vibrational frequencies of the molecule. The molecule is moving like that and modifying the frequency. So these side bands here in the spectrum, they tell you about it. so, so the fingerprint of this molecule here. That's Raman spectroscopy and can be used in this circumstance. And you see here, for example, the Raman spectra of the different blues of indigo, of small, of azurite, of Prussian blue, very easy, you don't have to understand this spectra, you just use them as fingerprints. That's how I use Raman spectroscopy now. And now I have my beloved lady in the bedroom, and just near to it I have another darling. And my, this second darling is my Raman spectrometer. And I like both of them. And both have their problems. 
my wife, 